just a little introduction. Uh, Matthew and his wife, Marianne, have been observing the Cape Clawless Otters on the Cape Peninsula coastline for the past 18 years. He says their first encounter with one of these charismatic otters took place uh, on the Komiki shoreline 17 years ago when they, made, when they met the local otter called Badi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mary Correct. Ann has, Ann has meticulously kept a record of their various encounters and experiences of this otters, and over time have developed a better understanding of the lives of the Cape Clonus otter. Although he says they always have more questions than answers, what we have learned, they're most happy to share with us today. So Matthew, without any waste of time, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. I think um, when we speak of passion, you are literally the definition of passion. And if I may throw it in there, I know Matthew might not mention it, Matthew is um, married to his wife, Mary Ann, for 50 years. Um, and their anniversary actually took place on the 2nd of January uh, in 2021. So with God's blessing, with God's grace, uh, God has kept you for us. And we see love and we see passion in your eyes. And we're really excited to have you today. And thank you so much. So without any waste of time, Matthew, the floor is yours. And everybody else, I will see you guys on the other side. Take it away, Matthew. Right. So thank you, John, for that uh, introduction. I uh, appreciate it. Um, you emphasize something which I just want to repeat again, which is that uh, this talk could not be possible without the fact that Mary Ann and I together have been observing otters for 18 years. Um, and I would not be able to have put this talk together nor write a book which I have just finished and I hope to get published about our experiences over the 18 years if it hadn't been for Mary Ann's meticulous um, record keeping in a field diary that she, field diaries that she has kept and that I have here on my desk and from which I've consulted both for this talk as well as the book. So in fact, well, although I am the speaker in this, uh, it is really a joint effort. Right, so if, I, if we're gonna talk about the Cape Lawless Otter, it's, it's necessary that we just see that the Cape Lawless Otter is one of 13 otters worldwide. There are in fact otters on every continent of the, the earth, except for Australia, the two, uh, the North and South Pole, um, and Greenland and New Zealand. So the none, apart from those places, there are otters in every continent on the planet. Um, I'm not going to enumerate every of those three, 13 otters, but I would just like to talk about one or two of them. The, the most, probably the best known one is the Eurasian otter. We find that in Europe, Great Britain, Ireland, Scotland, and then right across into Russia. Um, it's a small otter, it's smaller than ours. It's about between seven and 12 Ks. Um, and they, they eat crayfish and uh, or rather crab and uh, fish. In North America, we have the North American river otter slightly larger, has an elongated neck. Um, and that photo that I took there um, in a sanctuary in Britain, he stands up like a prairie dog. Uh, that's quite characteristic of them. They um, live off a whole range of, of um, prey, including little small animals and birds. Probably the, the otter that you would have come across in in, in postcards and uh, on uh, WhatsApp photos that sent between people and so on is the sea otter. They are literally sea otters. That is, they live in the sea. Probably 90 to 95 percent of their time is lived in the water. Um, they have adapted to live in the water. They have a various layers of fur, which enables them to to live in very cold conditions. You find them along the um, Californian, uh, Alaska, and Japanese uh, coastline. They always almost were extinct by the end of the 19th century into the 20th century due to hunting, but they have, their numbers have recovered due to conservation. Um, then that South, and South America, there's the giant otter. 
the giant otter and the sea otter are about the same size. The giant otter is just a little bit bigger. He's 32 Ks. They live in large family groups um, and up to 20 in a, in a group. They live in the Amazon basin and um, they uh, make a, what they call a, like a campsite. Um, and they, they have an air territory that they then occupy and that is their, that's their, that's their den. Um, they are very protective of their young and they would take on any uh, of the um, alligators and so on that would threaten them. Perhaps our favorite otter apart from the Cape Lawless otter is the small claw Asian otter. They are tiny, they are about the size of a large cat. They live in family groups. They are very active, um, hyperactive, fun and um, are always interacting with each other. Brings us to Africa and brings us to the Cape Lawless otter. And the Cape Lawless otter shares Africa with two other otters. The um, so-called Congo Clawless otter is actually slightly larger than our Cape Lawless otter. He's confined to the Congo Delta. Um, he's threatened as he has been hunted over the, the centuries uh, and he's very elusive, very rare to find him. It's an unusual sighting if you do see him. The other otter is the spotted neck otter in smaller numbers than our Cape Lawless otter. In fact, looks quite different to the Cape Lawless otter. Um, and he's called the neck, spotted neck otter because of two spots on his neck. And they share similar areas, but uh, they have different um, hunting habits. It brings us to the Cape Lawless otter. As you can see from my map, it stretches from Cape Town right up to just below the Sahara Desert. So our experience, as John had pointed out, is focused on the Cape Peninsula. Um, it started in Nuoto Komiki coastline and uh, went right up to the Slonklok light Lighthouse in Komiki. But I'll come back to that in a moment. I think it's fair enough at this point for me to point out to you um, just what makes up a Cape Lawless Otter. So the Cape Lawless Otter, he can weigh up to 18 Ks, although Mary Ann and I are sure that we've seen otters that are actually um, uh, larger than 18 Ks. Um, he has a, a, a sort of a domed head. And what is very characteristic of the Cape Lawless Otter is this white um, bib around the muzzle, um, the cheeks and the, and the chest. And when we are looking out for otters in the sea, often that white is what that white reflection is what we spot for the first time when we see an otter. Yes, so he's called the clawless otter for a good reason. Unlike all the other otters, apart from the small clawed Asian otter, our otter, the Cape clawless otter, doesn't have claws. In fact, the, it, as you can see, this is a photo I took of an otter that had been killed on the road at. Um, just outside um, Lavelli, and we were called in to come and see the otter. Was, the body was still warm when we got him. I took photos of this otter, and there you could see it looks like a hand, very similar to a baboon ha uh, hand. And in fact, if you flip this hand over, you would see he's got fingernails like us humans. We call these fingers digits, and this makes it very characteristic of the Cape Lawless otter. So as I said, very similar to this Asian small clawed. They also have finger or digits, although if you look very carefully at this picture, you'll see that they are um, slightly webbed. The whiskers of an otter is very important and particularly for the Cape Lawless otter. They, they are able to actually, through, the, through the, um, their whiskers, able to read the conditions of the, of the sea, the current, uh, we suspect even when it's high tide or low tide, and certainly they're able to detect any movement in the, in the, in the uh, waters, when the waters are murky, uh, whether there are crayfish present or bottom dwelling fish. The other part of the anatomy that's very important for our otter is the tail. Um, the uh, giant uh, otter that I refer to in, in Brazil, they, um, have a very flattish tail where our, ta our otter's tail is round at the top and flat at the bottom. And it certainly is an important part 
of his anatomy to help me be a very able swimmer. If in fact can swim very fast. Often when we're looking for otters, we'd spot them in one spot and then when they dive, as uh, this is not one of my photos, it's the only file photo that I've used. Um, as you can see, he, the otter will dive down and uh, the last part of the body that disappears is the tail. So often <laughs> the first suggestion that there's an otter out at sea would be the tail that we see disappearing. And then otter would, could be, usually dives around for no more than a minute, but we have in fact had experiences of otters who go down below water probably more than, than a minute, probably two minutes. So the otters around the Cape Peninsula coastline definitely in majority feed off crayfish. Um, my father was, uh, was a great lover of the sea, loved fishing and certainly loved his crayfish. When he ate a crayfish, he ate everything. He ate from the one end of the, of the crayfish to the other end, not our otters. They only eat the tail. And uh, that is an important in terms of how we spot them. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Every now and then you would find an otter bringing out uh, not a crayfish, but if, uh, like here, this photo is of a skarmwurk shark, which are bottom dwellers. That's why it's often we would find our otters actually fishing in low tide conditions so that they don't have to dive too deeply. Um, and they would then seek out um, creatures like the skarmwurk shark or eels, which they bring up. We always love it when an otter brings up a skarmwurk shark or an eel. It takes an otter uh, eating a crayfish, I would say about 10 minutes, whereas eating a skarmwurk shark or an eel it can take up to 20 minutes to even 40 minutes. When they eat a, a eel, they actually peel the skin back like, um, like a toffee. Um, and then they reveal the, the, the flesh under below and are able to then eat the prey. So remember the clawless otter paws. Yeah, you can see the very, very distinctive tracks. Tracking is a very important part of our observation of otters. Um, we, when we go to the sites that we believe we're going to find an otter, we obviously, obviously check the beach um, and look out for the tracks, um, the, the condition of the tracks, the age of the tracks, and their relationship of, of how between the tide marks. In other words, we were able to work out the, the last place that the uh, uh, track is seen and that they've been wiped out by the sea. We are actually able to work out how long ago the otters had actually come out of the sea to go to their couches. Um, so there, there's no confusing the otter tracks with dog tracks. These dog tracks always have their nail prints. The other element that's also important for obs observing and finding otters is their scat. They invariably, when they come out of the sea, they will uh, defecate. Um, uh, I, usually in the same spot, often on a rock, but sometimes on the beach amongst the kelp. The color of the, of the scat would tell us if it's, a, if it's a darkish color, then it usually means that they've eaten uh, crayfish. And if you fish around in the scat, you could probably see bits and pieces of, of, of shell. And if it's a, sort of a slimy green color, then it usually means they've been eating fish. The, 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 how strong the smell is of the scat is a very distinctive smell and often we smell it first before we see it will tell us again how fresh the scat is and that will also be an indicator of how recent the otter had come out of the sea. So waiting for otters, it can be a very long process. We spend many, many hours waiting for otters. So, in, and so just to briefly give you an idea of what we actually do when we're waiting for otters is that we've observed the seabirds around us. Here's a white fronted plover. There's their speckled eggs. You might have seen them in, at some time or other. They lay these eggs in the sand um, without any protection. Um, dog walkers, more dogs, motorbikes, cyclists all go over these beaches and will crush the eggs. Um, here is the uh, blacksmith plover, very good parents. They're usually very successful in raising their chicks. We have seen at Cape Point how they actually will dive bomb the baboons if the baboon is approaching a chick or maybe uh, an egg site. Uh, 
they are excellent. And, and most times we have, when we've watched and observed them, we have seen that they braise their chick right through to adulthood. Um, the oyster catchers at, at Komiki are important because that's a breeding ground for them. This photo I have here is actually was quite unusual because unlike any other times where they lay their eggs on a little sand mound, um, this, this, these eggs were laid inside a crevice of a rock uh, and we thought this was brilliant. The next year, the, the, the parents didn't. We also have summer visitors like the sandwich tern, which arrives around about the end of December, January. Very distinctive, um, swift, a uh, really distinctive tern. Uh, they dive bomb there for their prey. And early hours of the morning, when we go to the beach, we often would see the night herons returning from their night foraging. But the, the seabird that we watch the most and has the most importance for us is the Cape Gull. The Cape Gull often is a clue to fine otters. When we find an individual Cape or two gulls staring intently in a certain direction, or they are eating the head of a crayfish, we know that there probably has been an otter there recently and we would then scan the surrounding rocks as well as the sea to see if we could find that otter. Um, there are days when we will not see otters um, and we are amused because we would find that the, uh, probably sitting on the same rock, uh, a gull, so we assume it's the same gull and that they are like us waiting for an otter to turn up. Most of the times that we do see otters is when they exit. They would approach the, um, the, the beach um, and they would raise their, their upper part of their body, as you can see in this photo, and they would peer to make sure that the beach is clear. Um, for, for mother otters, this is even more important. They would be very careful about getting um, out. I took this photo rather naughtily um, many years ago now at Komiki. Um, there's a there's a flay at the back of the Komiki beach uh, and that flay empties out in a little channel into the sea. And that's often a site where the otters used to come out. And this otter came out of, at, at, that, at that site. Um, I crept around uh, the sand dunes and lay on top of the sand dune and she came, popped her head up to, to decide to come out, saw me and I clicked the camera. And that's the photo I got. She wasn't amused, she in fact hissed at me. Then she went across to Marianne and hissed at her. Marianne said, no, it's not me, it's him. He's the one. He's the one who scared you. Um, and so when, so when she, they, the mother otter finally decides it's safe to, to exit, they, they come out. Now this photo, you can see the little uh, cub running ahead of a mom. And we've seen a lot of that sort of exits, cub running ahead of mom. And we at one stage thought, oh, well, this is like the white rhino. Uh, Cape Lauders otter cubs run ahead of their mothers. But in fact, we've seen many other exits where it's the opposite way, way around. Mother leads the charge and the cubs follow. So we have come to the conclusion that this is just a domestic issue. The cub is, is, is tired, and wants to go to bed, and so it can't wait to... Uh, and in fact, what, often what happens, they come out, they sit on the edge of the beach, looking around to see if it, the coast is clear, and then the little cub just takes off and, and just puts her head down and runs, and then mommy has to follow. So when you have a group of otters, we call it a romp of otters. My grandson of eight years old just loves that word, romp. Um, so there's, in the literature, there's been a lot of discussion about romps of otters. Um, we just love it when we, there's, no, there's nothing quite like it to see a group of otters um, their heads popping out in the sea and approaching the beach and then cautiously coming out. As you can see from this photo on the left hand side, there's a leader. So invariably, uh, the, one of the group of the otters out of the romp would uh, act as a leader. Whether it's the same one every time, we're not sure. Um, and this otter would then look around as it does here, half raise its body to see everything is clear. And when the leader goes, very be the rest of the, the romp follows. So as I said in literature, there is discussions about romps and the opinion is, has been raised by scientists that most romps are made up of males. 
We don't actually quite agree with that. We have seen what we consider to be male romps, two or three male bachelors. But uh, on the whole, our experience of romps have been that they are made up of usually a natal mother uh, who has just had a cub. Um, she often would have with her this year's um, cub, which will be quite small, and then last year's cubs, and they would be sort of semi-adult, uh, uh, you know, coming up to adulthood, almost the size of mom. Um, and possibly she might have a sister with her. So the, the romp would then consist of mainly female, but obviously also uh, male cubs. Um, the cubs usually stay with the mom otter for about 18 months. That's about the average. We've had them stay longer and we've had them stay a little shorter. I will come back to that. There's an interesting story around that. So our, our, our story starts around about 2003. We used to walk the uh, Komiki Beach, or actually from Nurtu Parking to Komiki, to that um, outflow uh, from the flay, which we call the, the, the channel. This view that you have here would be the view that we would have had at the time. And we would walk up to that, look at it, and then walk back. But then one day, something amazing happened. We discovered an otter, which we discovered later on was called Buddy by the local people. So I've been set um, Buddy here, uh, the photo of him, yeah, in the spot exactly where he was seen by us in, in this view of Harpe from the uh, Komiki side. Behind us, behind this photo, is the Klein Slong Club. Sklane's Slong Corp estate. Um, in fact, Mary Ann and I had been having a bit of a, a domestic argument uh, and uh, we weren't reaching any agreement. We finally arrived at the spot and we stood there, you know, for a moment, not saying anything, just looking out at this amazing view. When I, to my utter astonishment, saw an otter foraging around the rocks there, these rocks that you see here in this photo. And I said to Marion, this Cape Lawless Otter. And she said, absolute nonsense, it's a Cape Seal. What I didn't realize is that what I didn't see was that there was a Cape Seal lying on top of one of those rocks drying out. And she saw the seal and I saw the otter. So we had another argument. And so we both have our eyes lighted on the otter. And we were amazed because we'd always wanted to see the Cape Lawless Otter. We'd seen otters in Britain at the sanctuaries there. Uh, we'd considered going on the Cape, on the, um, the otter trail um, and here was an otter we never thought there were otters in the cape peninsula we never thought we'd find one and that was the beginning of our experience of otters so buddy was a bitch to humans he actually had um, um, a sort of a, a home at the solole which was a nature reserve at that time 18 years ago um, he would stay at Solole, they had a little, like a little pond there and uh, some reeds and he used to lie up in them. And then he would cross the, the main road, which today, if he did that today, he undoubtedly would have been just killed. Busy. But in those days, he used to cross the road and then travel, I would say, probably over about a kilometer to get to the sea where he would do his fishing and then he would return back to Solole. So in time, he actually had become habituated. This photo that you see here is of a friend of ours, Ellen. We, uh, we made a number of friends in Komiki with our otter watching. They became aware of us as, you know, as regulars and speculated who we were. Ellen also had a passion for, for otters, particularly for this otter, Buddy. Um, as you can see here, this is Buddy coming up and sniffing her. No other otter would do this. This was a most unused experience. Uh, and it just meant that we were introduced to the life of otters through this most un unusual and most charismatic otter. So Buddy had a, a great fondness for the Glens Long Claw um, estate. The estate uh, houses, they have, a number of them have swing pools with wooden decks. Um, he would then later on less frequently went to Solole and started sleeping in the Plain Slong Corp estate. Um, what he would do, he would come out and um, come and lie on, on the deck of one of the houses. 
Um, and invariably, then he would go for a swim in the pool, um, cleaning off his uh, sand. We for, first thought as this was just very cute and we obviously took lots of photos and videos. And then we actually began to realize what this was about. Cape Clawless otters are land otters. They rely on water, usually rivers and dams for their food, but that is, they do not inhabit the, the, the water as such. So when a Cape Lawless otter lives by the sea, along the Cape uh, coastline, uh, and they enter the sea to go and catch their prey, obviously the sea salt would adhere to the coat. You know that you've spent a lot of time in the sea, you have this sort of, this, this feeding on your skin and, and you need a good shower. Because that's the salt that's adhering to your skin. Well, that's what happens to their fur. So they have to get rid of this sea salt. Otherwise, over time, the, the, the fur will get caked and they would lose its, its waterproof prop properties. So they would have to go uh, swim in a river. There are, not, there are not many rivers along our coast and um, uh, emptying out in the sea. So um, a swimming pool is just a very good place to go and get rid of your sand. Underneath the, these decks, which were often raised up high, uh, there would be a, a hollow and Buddy would then crawl underneath the deck uh, to sleep. When an otter does that, when an otter enters any sort of cav cavity area, like a little cave or a crevice that sort of forms a, like a little room, um, we refer to that as a halt. In the literature, it is identified not as a den, but as a halt. Um, in Britain, um, there are a number of books have been written about the Eurasian otter in Britain. And there, the authors always speak about their otters um, inhabiting various halts. In our case, with the Cape Lourdes otter, and uh, certainly along the um, peninsula coastline, there are not many natural little caves for otters to go and inhabit, to use as a halt. So invariably, they will lie up in a, in a reed bed. Here, this photo of Buddy is actually taken of him lying in someone's garden right there on the beachfront. The owners were very kind to allow him to do this and they were very kind to allow me to enter the garden to take this photo. Um, so we know this is known as couching. So in or lay, he lie, he's lying on a couch and so we call it couching. Uh, and this is fairly common for our Cape Claudus otters. They would couch most of the time when they go to go and sleep and they sleep mostly during the day. The literature uh, maintains that the average age of our Cape Claudus otters is about 15 years. In our experience, having observed them for the last 18 years around the coastline and being able to identify certain otters um, consistently over the years, we feel that otters don't survive longer than seven, eight years, maybe nine. And the reason for that probably is because these otters are living under very harsh conditions, hot summers, wet, cold winters, and they are always exposed. So it's a very tough life. We've actually observed otters, or we can see as old, and we can see how they are, are struggling, and uh, invariably a month or two later, we no longer see them. So, you know, we know that they don't have a very long life. Buddy had a most unusual habit. And this was unique to Buddy. We've only seen this one other time uh, subs in subsequent years. Otters would feed in the sea um, and then uh, either doing it lying on their backs, eating small little crabs or, or sitting on a rock eating their crayfish or their skalmok shark. And then they would leave and they go and couch. But Buddy sometimes used to bring home uh, uh, a midnight snack. And here he's carrying a, a skalmok shark. He's going home. And here he has got a crayfish which he brought out. Uh, he's sitting here in an in a, in a old cement drain, which also acts as a sort of a temporary halt. He sometimes slept in there, but didn't stay there for very long. He invariably would retreat into the, um, to the estate, taking his crayfish. This didn't please the, um, the owners of the estates because um, um, they would find the, the remains of their crayfish would be clogging up their uh, filters and um, smell 
the take a down into underneath the deck, the smell of the fish or the crayfish over time would be quite strong. Uh, we didn't understand that because we felt it was such a privilege to have an otter under your house. This is uh, most, was, this is Buddy sand rolling. So the first time I was actually there when Marianne and our friend Ellen witnessed this, uh, Buddy came out of the sea like he usually does. And this time he rolled around in the sand, in, in, the, in the wet sand. And we first thought this again was just a very cute behavior characteristic of Buddy. We didn't realize uh, at that time, but have certainly, certainly subsequently worked it out. When the otter comes out, and uh, rolls in the sand and then goes and couches in, 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 a, in a reed bed or in some grass. Over time, as the fur dries, the sand also dries out and obviously uh, gets shaken out of, of the fur. With that takes the sea salt out of it. So it is another way for the otter to actually get rid of the sea sand. Uh, this is the photo of Mary Ann videoing Buddy. So you can see from this, um, even though it's foreshortened, you can see how close we were able to approach Buddy. Um, this is the only otter we've ever been able to get that close. And that's how habituated Buddy was. Yeah, he in fact is sad. For a time, Mary Ann and I were um, voluntary uh, rangers um, with sand parks um, and our responsibility was part of our duty as rangers were to patrol the Komiki Lurtu coastline and to educate people who were walking their dogs in that area. This photo I took of these two dogs, they, there was an otter on those rocks at the background and these and as invariably happens when dogs see otters, they go for them. And these two dogs went for the otter, who then bayed at them and was trying to um, you know, warn them off. We uh, called on the owners and we were in our uniform. We called on the otters and asked them to please um, call their dogs. And of course, the dogs don't listen to their masters. This is far more exciting. So in fact, uh, they had to strip down um, to go rush in and actually drag their dogs out. Buddy, um, Buddy was uh, Buddy was the master of the beach. Um, this, this little Russell here, Jack Russell here, uh, was one of a, of a pair that belonged to a well-known rugby player who lived uh, also at Komiki. Uh, and these two dogs were a bit naughty, and they used to roam around the the beach on their own and chase the birds and the, and the white lovers. Um, but whenever uh, Buddy came across them, he saw them off the beach. He was the master. So in 2007, we began to notice a very alarming aspect about Buddy. We noticed that he had these red sores on his digits and sometimes around his muzzle. And in a very short time, we realized with a great shock, that in fact, he was losing his digits um, to the point where he, in fact, had no digits at all. Um, we were not, uh, you know, we were puzzled at this. We tried to um, try to. Uh, we spoke to various vets about it. Uh, they had various theories. The idea was at one stage we try and dart him so that he could be taken in and, and be examined. Um, but the the concern was that if he was darted, he would probably rush into the sea before the drug to effect, and he would then drown. So, in fact, we never were able to capture him. Uh, but uh, subsequently, um, we have worked out that it was probably with the help of our dermatologist, that is a, a virus that you'll find in um, unclean water, polluted water, uh, and that can have this effect of causing uh, sores, which if untreated would end up in loss of limb, you know, of fingers and so on. Uh, but it could be treated with, with um, for antibiotics. This photo here is, you can see that Buddy has actually got a crayfish there tucked between his, uh, his legs. So although he had lost all his digits, um, you can see even the back, you can even see the back paw there. There's not, I think there's about two digits left there. Um, he was able to still catch his prey, mostly crayfish, um, and uh, was still able to eat. 
however, it was a very painful thing to watch Buddy come out of the sea. Sometimes he he would come at low tide. The, he would have to approach the um, coastline over rocks. And here he is coming over the rocks. He's again bringing home his midnight smack, snack. And um, you could see that it was actually painful the way he gingerly put down the next uh, next leg onto the onto the rocks there it was painful so Marianne and I had been watching and observing Gladi and other otters I'll come to them in a moment um, for since 2004 um, and while, while Marianne was teaching and I was um, working at Stellenbosch we would then have weekends free and so we spent most weekends at least a saturday maybe a sunday sometimes both days at komiki and and most times we would have seen buddy at least once if not twice over that weekend but in 2007 when these digits began to fall off um we actually began to see less less of buddy uh, and Ellen, who often reported to us what she, because she would walk the beach during the week, she would report her sightings to us. Um, she um, also noted what we had noted, but we weren't seeing much of Buddy. Um, and then, in fact, in the middle of the year, we went off to Kruger for a Kruger holiday, two weeks. And when we came back, she said to us that she had only seen him once. And we certainly did not see him again for the next couple of months. So by September of that year, we realized that we had not seen Buddy and we had to conclude that Buddy had died. Uh, we're not sure where or how, but um, you know, we never saw him again. That was a very sad ending to a very charismatic otter. And we're always grateful to Mop Buddy because he certainly introduced us to the world of otters. So there were other otters. There was a time when we, we kept seeing an otter um, well, we kept seeing what we believe to be Buddy, but when Mary Ann started analyzing my photos, she noticed that uh, this one particular otter had a little nip out of the, uh, the one ear. And uh, we realized this was a, a different otter. And then also when we observed her more closely, we realized it was a female otter and we named her Bright Eyes. And we saw a lot of Bright Eyes and she became very important in our life uh, in, in, in observing otters as she had a number of cubs over the years, uh, we were able to observe her with her cubs. This was the first cub that we saw with her. Unfortunately, this poor cub was named Squeak because cub otters, and this is a very helpful thing to know about cubs, is that they, they have a squeak. It sounds a bit like a, like a bird. And they separate from their mother and they get anxious, they would squeak. Uh, so when we arrive on the beach and, and, and it's still sort of semi-dark and we hear the squeak, then we know there's the otters about. The squeak is squeak more than normally. Um, she was always very anxious, very anxious. And even when she had grown up uh, and was then part of a romp and she got left behind, she would squeak. Yeah, her mother and her are coming out uh, near the Bokram River at uh, Long Beach in Komiki. So th there were some other otters. There's this little one we call Dimple from the, 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 the nursery rhyme. Um, the last, there were several other cubs and the last cub that we, uh, we know that Bright Eyes had, we called Noel. I had over time, I was able to actually identify Bright Eyes' track. She had her front left paw, two of the digits were fused. And so her track was quite distinctive. So over time, we were able to always track whether she had been about. And this Christmas, I was in the Christmas holidays, the school closed. We were visiting the beach and um, I saw her tracks, but I also, we also saw these tiny little tracks. So we know she had another cub. Um, and we were in fact the first ones to see the cub. Bit of a competition with Ellen about that. We wanted to be the first to see the otter, uh, and we saw the little cub in just the beginning of January. So inevitably, the cub was named Noel. Our mother otters um, are tough. They they exercise tough love. So 
in learning, once the cub is introduced to the sea, they don't naturally take the water. They have to actually, actually have to get used to the water. Once they're used to swimming in the sea or the river, wherever they live, uh, the mother would then introduce them to feeding for themselves. So in our case, we would often see, uh, like with bright eyes, she would bring the cub with her to the beach. Um, this would happen early hours of the morning. She would catch a small uh, crayfish, hand it to the cub, and then leave the cub. The cub would then obviously consume this crayfish. Uh, thereafter, the mother would catch her own prey, and whenever the cub approaches her, <clears throat> she would refuse to part with her uh, food. And this was clearly uh, teaching the cub that they needed to go and actually learn to get their own food. But Noel was quite a feisty little otter, <clears throat> and here you can see uh, she's tearing at, a, at the bits and pieces of a skamwag shark that uh, no, the bright eyes had caught. And that she actually, at the end of this photographs, uh, this photo session, she actually had torn a piece off and was quite happily eating her, her part of the cat. So, Marianne always says that um, Noel was presented to us by her mother. She, she used to come past us, quite close to us, almost as close as Buddy, um, and uh, Noel obviously got used to us. And then to our amazement, you might recall that I said that cubs stay with their mothers for about 18 months. Well, it was hardly six months when, uh, six to eight months when uh, Noel was on his own. Um, and we're not sure why she abandoned him. We did notice one or two little sores on him, which also alarmed us. And whether she felt that there was something wrong with the otter, we're not sure. But she abandoned, uh, unusually, she abandoned Noel. And Noel was on his own. But he was able to look after himself, and he certainly went out and fought his crayfish. Um, and he was quite happy for us to be to approach him, you know, closely. Um, and we thought, ah, we have a second buddy here. I don't know what happens when Wabi, when we go off to Kruger and we come back, you know, things have changed. Well, this happened again. We that year we went off to Kruger. Uh, and came back and there was no 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 well he had disappeared and months went by and we never saw him again we're not sure what happened to noel whether he died or whether he was pushed out by a dominant uh, male otter we have actually seen a male otter chase another male otter out of of his territory whether that had happened we're not sure but very sadly we never again had that sort of um experience so we did see other otters uh, and we were able to identify them through their behavior mostly. It's very difficult to distinguish one otter from another, but it's usually behavior that uh, indicates what an otter is like. This otter was also quite uh, comfortable with us being quite close. And since we felt lucky seeing another otter, it was named Otter. L L uh, he's, this otter was named Lucky. A bit of a story to this one, Bruiser. Uh, probably fits the, the the look of this this otter. This photo was taken. Um, we uh, decided to see if we can find otters coming out of the sea early hours of the morning. We were on the Komiki beach. It was full moon and we were there before the sunrise uh, and we were waiting there for the otters and when we actually heard them coming across the the wet beach we could actually hear they were the, the thunder of was about five or six in the, in the romp. We could hear them running across the beach. We were very excited. So we, we left off our, our perch on top of a big rock and we hid behind some low rocks and I lay there ready with my camera. They came straight for us um, and this lead, the leader, this otter, top, came over the top, saw me, I snapped this photo. He rolled back squealing onto the other otters who all squealed and they all ran into the sea. Uh, subsequent, we, we saw an, uh, an individual otter on his own in this area over consistently over a period of time. And from the photos, we certainly identified that otter to be this otter and um, Marianne Nermly um, Bruiser. Whether it was male or female, we wouldn't quite determine that. We have we made various friends over the years, and um, including a, a, an American couple uh, who had been missionaries in uh, Rhodesia and Zimbabwe. Um, and then retired back 
to um, Seattle, but they used to come out uh, for a couple of months every year and stay in uh, their son's um, cottage at just behind the Klein Schlankop estate. And they used to sit on a bench that had been erected in honor of a surfer um, who had actually died from a shark attack in this in this very area of the beach. And they used to sit there on this on this bench, this stone bench. Um, and at one stage, this otter used to come regularly out at this spot just opposite the bench and then go up the channel to go to the back to the flag. Uh, and so he became known as Mr. Flag. It was a time, I don't know if some of you remember the, the movie Chocolat, where we were, we had seen the movie and we kept seeing an otter who had this very nice dark chocolatey coat. So again, the otter was called. So our friends, Rick and Joanne, uh, one day I was actually sitting with them on this bench. Marianne was at school. I, I was already retired, so I was able to join them. And I was sitting with them chatting, having our morning coffee, when this otter appeared out, out of the sea, came through a, these cleft of these rocks. I took this photo, and as you can see, he's got his morning gloves on. Uh, and he, the moment I clicked the camera, he turned around and ran away and back into the sea. Um, I showed this photo to Joanne, who just loved it, and I actually printed it out and gave it to her as a gift. So it's known as Joanne's Otter, and I think this will be a very excellent photo for the cover of my book. So, since 2003, 2004, watching and observing otters and seeing various uh, individual otters and romps of otters, um, we were we accounted for probably about 12 to 15 otters that we felt, you know, was. In, it was present in this part of the coastline. In 2012, we were very much aware, and certainly it's reflected in Marianne's field diaries, we were seeing less and less otters. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were less and less tracks uh, to the point where we began to, you know, feel that we would sometimes we'd go for a weekend and not see any otters. Sometimes we'd see a, a track, but often not. Um, and we began to realize that there, this was a time when there was quite a lot of heavy poaching taking place in this area. Um, and one of the locals who we also befriended maintained that there had been a crash in the crayfish population in that area. So that could account for why the otters didn't actually uh, you know, keep returning. Also, there was definitely an increase in, in beach walkers and um, uh, with their dogs. So that probably was an additional uh, deterrent. So we were reaching a point where we began to feel rather frustrated uh, about observing our otters when a friend who also lived at Komiki and was a great walker said we should go to Cape Point because he has seen otter tracks there. Well, we'd never considered going to Cape Point because, well, erroneously, I had thought that there weren't any, uh, there was no freshwater rivers or streams in Cape Point. And so why would a Cape Flawless otter go there and not be able to actually uh, have fresh water to drink or to wash off the sea salt. But when we got there, we discovered there were some um, some there were some rivers or little streams, and more importantly, we actually found the tracks, and that began our time of turning to Cape Point, where we did see uh, otters. Um, Unlike our experience at the Komiki Nurtuk coastline, we haven't really had the same consistency of seeing individual otters or being able to identify them. At the beginning, we did see one otter uh, who was near the Ulifansbos cottage. Um, and so, and we realized from her condition, she was a natal mother um, and obviously was, uh, the cub was still left at home. And she was going out to feed for herself. We would hide away, and she, but she was pretty quick to be able to spot us. We called her cottage, and there was a little sort of cat and mouse game between her and us to, as to when she, we, as to where we would hide so that she wouldn't see us. But every time she seemed to find us. So we had seen other single otters over a period of time, um, 
and uh, more importantly, uh, mother, mother, natal mothers and their cubs. And in fact, probably the most consistent uh, sighting would be with mother otters and cubs at Cape Point. It would be over a period of time. Uh, cubs are usually born around about um, ember, and, um, and then from that onwards, the mother would introduce them to the to the to the area. As a part of, uh, they they would choose a part of the coastline which is fairly is you know safe in terms of the sea. Um, and then um, slowly introduce the cubs to the idea of actually they actually have to move up and down the coast. Um, and that's the time when we are able to observe them. So to, to come to some sort of conclusion, um, I think I just need to point out that Mary Ann and I over the 18 years have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours going out to look for otters. Um, and we spent those hours waiting for otters, and hence we became interested in, in, in the seabirds because you know you have to do something while you're waiting for them. So if from this presentation you think, ah, oh, great, I'm just going to go down to the beach and see an otter, it's more than likely that will not happen. Um, there are otters right around the, the Cape the Peninsula. Uh, there are otters at Storms River. There's otters at Betty's Bay, um, Roy Els. Um, various places up the west coast um, but again it is a question of being consistent in terms of spending many many days many many hours observing what you see in terms of tracks and scat whether you would actually be lucky enough to see any otters um, and i think that um, i would like to conclude with the observation from crook who is a world expert on otters is that a, uh, otters are always an indication of the health of an ecosystem. If the otters are dying out, then that means that your ecosystem is actually uh, in danger. And a healthy ecosystem is essential for the survival of our planet, as David Attenborough has pointed out in his latest book, uh, A Life on Our Planet, which I recommend that you re read if you haven't read it. So I thank you all very much for listening to me. And I hope that uh, you have found it interesting. Um, we certainly um, enjoy the process. Thank you. Hey, Matthew. Oh, Mr. Sathas, I think that was uh, what, what an amazing, an amazing, an amazing um, topic. I think when we began uh, the presentation, we said, this is going to be a presentation riddled with love and um, the, the passion that you have for the work that you do and for, for the passion that you have for the Cape Otters, it's just so mind blowing. And uh, I was actually checking down all the comments that were coming in and everybody kept on saying, you know, comments, oh, lovely pictures up until, up until literally the disappearance of um of our Adi. favorite ape auto <laughs> and and everybody just kept quiet and i think you you literally almost brought many of us to tears uh, just mm. with the passion and i think um what a lovely story um at this point in time um uh i have just a, a few uh, a few questions uh, but mostly comments um mm -hmm. And then uh, the first one from Nicola. And Nicola, I don't know if you could rephrase that, that question. You're saying very interesting, are they endangered? Yes, actually, yeah. No, I think it's, it's phrased quite well. So if you could just run us through that, are the Cape otters an endangered species? Um, I think your presentation kind of was taking us in, in some sort of direction, but we, we're really keen to know what's happening there. That's a good question, Nicola. Um... Uh, in the in the 18 years that we've observed otters and we've tried to keep some kind of uh, tally as to the, how many otters we are seeing to get an idea of how many otters are present and, and you know every year we see that there are otter cubs um, and invariably uh, whichever site we are present at it's usually three or four ot uh, otter cubs we can account for but what alarms us is that 
if we do a, a, a tally at the end of each season, we seem to keep coming back to the same number. So around about 12. So the, the, the otter population is, is stable, but not growing. Um, and um, I suspect it's partly due to the environmental conditions in which our Cape Claudius otters are around. You know, they have to basically compete with humans. Apart from uh, Cape Point, you know, the rest of the coastline is inhabited by humans. So they have to actually compete with us humans. Um, and uh, that might account for the fact that, uh, you know, the population is not growing. So are they uh, under threat? They, as far as I know, they're not listed as being under threat, but uh, we do consider, we do, we do feel some sense of alarm at the fact that the numbers aren't growing. No, thank you for that. Um, we've got we've got Jill. Uh, we've got Jill who says a, a fascinating presentation. Thank you. What an un unbelievable dedication you have for both discovering and researching artists. Um, oh, our lovely son Chris, uh, back in the UK, is, um, <laughs> says uh, <laughs> we're just going to start referring to him as our son now. <laughs> yeah, our <was> awesome. son. <laughs> He says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, absolutely true dedication uh, to the otter. May I ask, um, what is the most otters uh, you've seen at one time? I think you've kind of mentioned it, but um, if you could just take us through that. <laughs> uh, Chris is referring to a time when he was coming to visit us and Marianne was going to go and fetch him at the airport. But being a true otter spotter, she first went to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> up at 10 o'clock in the morning or something so she went to comic beach and um i actually said to her i wish you uh 12 otters uh which was just a joke um and she actually did see 12 otters that morning which was the most otters we've seen in any given time so yes <laughs> he's referring to that incident wow <laughs> um if if uh, if i may ask um i know i know this is um you know, would probably be, oh, you know, controversial to a certain degree. Um, mm. But you mentioned, you mentioned something about the, you know, dogs, walking dogs on the beach. Um, yes. So the sort of the presence of dogs um, uh, in relation to the otters. Uh, do you think in general that dogs perhaps maybe tend to pose a lot more high risk towards uh, the natural inhabitants of nature, like the otters and maybe probably other living animals uh, out in the wild. Well, to be frank, in our experience, yes. Um, you know, as I said, when we used to patrol the coastline, um, I mean, there were often times when people would just release their dogs and they would go rushing across the um, beach over the area where the um, oyster catchers were breeding. Uh, and invariably, obviously, would destroy eggs uh, or, or, you know, terrify the, 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 the parents. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, we've seen um, and we know of many otters that have been attacked by dogs. So, yeah, uh, in our opinion, you know, people don't necessarily uh, train their dogs and discipline them. We have, we have been, many, many years ago, we were in Austria and we actually attended a, a, a show, a, um, a horse show, and there were people there with their, their German shepherds and those German shepherds sat perfectly, calmly, never moved, listened to their masters. That kind of discipline we often don't see with our dogs um, and people just seem to think once they're on the beach they can go wild. Um, so yes, I think dogs are, untrained dogs are a threat to nature. Sure. Um, and I think that's quite, that's quite a, strongly that's put. Really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I suppose I suppose um, it's platforms like this that allow us to, you know, talk frankly to one another, and perhaps maybe yeah. to raise importance awareness. Uh, perhaps maybe some of us may not be aware of of um, our behavior and and what type of impact that we have in society because of I think the last statement that you mentioned that you know the the less presence of otters means there's something in the ecosystem, there's something wrong in the ecosystem. And I think that should really yeah. raise alarm bells uh, for all of us. And, you know, we want to live, to live in this beautiful planet, but be able to leave it for, for future generations to come. Absolutely. Um, I've Absolutely. got, uh, let's take one more question, perhaps uh, just so that, you know, as we, the numbers are trickling down a little bit. Um, 
Uh, this question is coming from, I'm not too sure where it's coming from, but it says, um, we've seen Cape Otis in the Zambezi River in Namibia. Uh, mm. They also only ate uh, the tails and left the still, still living fish uh, to sink to the bottom of the river. Uh, is mm -hmm. this behavior common? Um, I don't have much experience of, of inland uh, Cape lawless otters, um, but uh, yes, I, as I said, from what we're observing, but what we've observed, they, as I said, they eat the tail of a crayfish, but they seem to consume the entire fish when we've seen them catch fish on the coastline. So I'm not sure why they would have left parts of the, they might have been disturbed uh, in the eating, because our experience is they eat the whole fish uh, from the head to the tail. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Um, let me perhaps maybe just take one more. Um, uh, this one is from um, Roger, who says, you speak a lot about mother otter uh, with their cubs. Uh, do you see mm. many father otters as well? Do I see many? Uh, father otters as well. Oh, father otters. Yes, I said we, we do from time to time, and they are you invariably on their own, uh, the male otters. Um, as they obviously uh, will breed with, with the female otters. So we are able, uh, over the years, we have seen individual male otters. Uh, we've been able to identify them from uh, their behavior. Some of them are very uh, cautious um, and we give them names like Phantom and Scarlet Topanel, <laughs> which tells you something about their behavior. But yeah, we do see individuals, we do see male otters, but invariably they're unknown. And when you see a romp, as I said, it's mostly made up of, of, of mother otters with cubs and maybe an auntie or two. Mm. Well, maybe uh, I just want to make a point, John, do I just make a point about, you know, I sound quite righteous about this thing about dogs. I must tell you that in the early days when we, my Marianne and I walked the Nuerto Beach, we had, we had a, a spaniel dog and we allowed the spaniel dog to chase the birds. You know, and at the time we never thought about it. It's only with consciousness that we become aware that you know what what we were doing. So I'm 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 just saying that it is a matter of of being becoming aware of of the impact that we are having on our environment. So I'm not being self righteous about this. I'm just saying we've learned our own lesson uh, over the years. Mm, sure. Ah, uh, Mr. Matthew Safest, I think oh, I think you've wrapped it up quite nicely. And, okay. and I think that's, that's how life is, you know, we live and learn and we, we grow and we, we, we start taking a little bit more notice of our behavior and, and in fact, the impact that we have on nature itself. Mm. So I think you've wrapped it up beautifully and um, we're not going to go too much into that, I suppose, uh, that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when all uh, the dog lovers who want to kill all of us <laughs> and we are all <laughs> We are all dog lovers, but I think it's it's a matter of saying, let's be conscious, let's see how we can best work together, uh, you know, to preserve um, this beautiful ecosystem that we've got. Ladies Absolutely. and gentlemen, without any waste of time, um, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful bi-weekly Wednesday talk. Thank you for everybody that is joining us from all over the world. Uh, it's been a true privilege to have you guys with us this morning. Uh, remember, uh, this talk is also recorded. It's live on Facebook page, on the Kirsten Bosch Facebook page, as well as the Straight Nature Facebook page. So please feel free to go and visit our pages, Facebook pages, and you can get um, the full recording of this presentation and just relive these beautiful moments that you've just had. Uh, once again, thank you to all our partners, Room to Grow. Uh, remember, if you're looking to get your, your, your garden designed, Room to Grow has got your back. Um, if you're looking for the latest and the greatest in what nature has to offer, Straight Nature uh, is out there and we've got a beautiful uh, bookshop at Kirstenbosch. Uh, be on the lookout for Matthew Cypher's uh, book coming out soon. <laughs> no pressure, but we're just going to put it out there in the universe. Um, we really look forward to, you know, to, uh, you know, getting our, sinking our teeth into the work that you do and also sharing in the passion that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, you thank know. you so much. Um, from all of us and all the team that put this wonderful presentation together. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you, Belinda, all the team that's working behind the scene to make this possible. Without any waste of time, remember to sanitize, 
Keep a safe social distance and wear your mask. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you again in the next two weeks when we have another fantastic talk. Master Matthew, thank you. Over and out. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye, everybody.